for a question, you may press the one followed by the four on your telephone. Please remain connected. The call will begin in approximately two minutes. We thank you for your patience. Good afternoon, my name is Fran, and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the Meta fourth quarter and full year 2021 earnings conference call. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during that time, please press the one and then the number four on your telephone keypad. The call will be recorded. Thank you very much. Ms. Deborah Crawford, Facebook's Vice President of Investor Relations, you may begin. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome to Meta's fourth quarter and full year 2021 earnings conference call. Joining me today to discuss our results are Mark Zuckerberg, CEO, Cheryl Sandberg, COO, and Dave Weiner, CFO. Before we get started, I would like to take this opportunity to remind you that our remarks today will include forward-looking statements. Actual results may differ materially from those contemplated by these forward-looking statements. Factors that could cause these results to differ materially are set forth in today's press release and in our quarterly report on Form 10-Q filed with the SEC. Any forward-looking statements that we make on this call are based on assumptions as of today, and we undertake no obligation to update these statements as a result of new information or future events. During this call, we may present both GAAP and non-GAAP financial measures. A reconciliation of GAAP to non-GAAP measures is included in today's earnings press release. The press release and an accompanying investor presentation are available on our website at investor.fb.com. And now I'd like to turn the call over to Mark. Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining today. This was a solid quarter for our products and business. It was also an important one for our company. In October, we announced that Meta uh, would be our new name, and we laid out our vision for the metaverse. And when we shared our plan to connect, I, I said this is not something that we're going to do on our own. The metaverse will be built by creators and developers, it will be interoperable, and will touch many different parts of the economy. In the months since, it's been exciting to see lots of other companies share their own plans for the metaverse and how their experiences and products might show up too. And I look forward to partnering with a lot of them as we work to bring this to life together. Now, if last year was about putting a stake in the ground for where we're heading, then this year is going to be about executing. And today, I'm going to discuss uh, our seven uh, major investment priorities for 2022. And they're reels, community messaging, commerce, ads, privacy, AI, and of course, the metaverse. And these are the areas that we're putting a lot more talent and budget towards. But before I get to that, I want to briefly touch on our Q4 results, which I know Cheryl and Dave are going to go deeper on. I'm proud of the work that our teams did here. Uh, we shipped products, our community continued to grow, and businesses of all sizes turned to us uh, to help them reach people. But there are two things that I want to call out uh, that are having an impact on our business. The first is competition. Uh, people have a lot of choices for how they want to spend their time. And apps like TikTok are growing very quickly. And this is why our focus on reels is so important over the long term, as is our work to make sure that our apps are the best services out there for young adults, which I spoke about on our last call. The second area and related to this is that we are in the middle of a transition on our own services towards short form video like reels. So as more activity shifts towards this medium, we are replacing some time and news feed and other higher monetizing services. So as a result of both competition and the shift to short-term, short-form video, as well as our focus on serving young adults over optimizing overall engagement, we're gonna to continue to see some pressure on impression growth in the near term. Now I'm confident that leaning harder into these trends is the right short-term trade-off to make in order to get long-term gains. But we've made these types of transitions before with mobile feed and stories, where we took on headwinds in the near term to align with important trends over the long term. And while video has historically been slower to monetize, we believe that over time, short form video is going to monetize more like feed or stories than like watch. So I'm optimistic that we'll get to where we need to be with reels too. 
ultimately, our continued success relies on building new products that people find valuable and enjoy using. And in a competitive marketplace, uh, we are focused on understanding the areas that we deliver on for people and executing against the strategy. Dave is going to share more on the impact to our business in a minute, but uh, before we get to that, I want to discuss our investment priorities for 2022. The first one is Reels. Now, it's clear that short-form video will be an increasing part of how people consume content moving forward. And Reels is now our fastest growing content format by far. It's already the biggest contributor to engagement growth on Instagram, and it is growing very quickly on Facebook too. And as we continue to improve the tools for creators, ranking for the people watching, and as we roll out the product everywhere across the world, we expect that this will continue growing quickly. So looking ahead, we're investing in simplifying video across Instagram, uh, building more great creative and monetization tools for creators, and helping more people discover and interact with relevant reels. The next investment priority is community messaging, which is about chatting with groups of people that you have some, something in common with, whether that's a shared community, an interest or experience. You know, we, we already run some of the world's most popular messaging platforms where people connect one-on-one -on -one or in groups with friends, family, and colleagues. And we're seeing people increasingly want to share more things in messages that uh, they were previously maybe posted to feed. So I think the, the popularity that we're seeing um, with apps like Slack in the workplace or Discord or Telegram uh, reflects this trend too. So we're going to uh, help people on WhatsApp better organize their group chats and make it easier to find information for the communities that they're a part of, like parent groups or neighborhoods. And we're also building community chats on Facebook and Messenger for real-time conversations within those groups and communities. Now, I also want to call out business messaging, since it's an area where there's some real momentum here. Uh, we estimate that there are more than 1 billion users are connecting with a business account across our messaging services every week. And we're partnering with companies like Uber and Geomart to help people book a ride or have their groceries delivered right from a chat. And we're building new tools to make buying online better for people and easier to manage for businesses. And we believe that this can be an important business uh, for us in the years to come. We're also making good progress on our broader commerce efforts. We already help a lot of businesses reach new and existing customers with personalized ads, and our commerce tools are an extension of that. It's a, a seamless way for people and businesses to buy and sell through our apps. And our strategy here, since introducing shops a year and a half ago, has been to make it as easy as possible for people to make a purchase after discovering a new brand or product without having to switch over to a browser or re-enter their payment info. And Cheryl will share more about our progress here, including some of the success we saw over the holidays. The next up is ads. And with Apple's iOS changes and uh, new regulation in Europe, there is a clear trend where less data is available to deliver personalized ads. But people still want to see relevant ads, and businesses still want to reach the right customers. So we are rebuilding a lot of our ads infrastructure so we can continue to grow and deliver high-quality personalized ads. Now, the next two priorities I want to discuss focus on infrastructure that underpins all of our products. Uh, the first one is privacy. And we've made huge investments in strengthening our approach to privacy, including rebuilding our privacy program um, and our privacy review process. And we made updates to bring greater privacy to our products, including end-to-end -end encrypted backups and disappearing messages on WhatsApp, and end-to-end -end encrypted voice and video calling on Messenger. And over the next few years, uh, we're focused on building out um, a major privacy infrastructure project that will encode our privacy commitments at a deeper level of our technical foundation to make them more durable and make product development faster in this evolving environment. Now, on to AI. Um, this is one of the areas where we've routinely seen stronger returns on our investments over time than we've expected. Advances in AI enable a lot of the experience that I've talked about so far. They, it enables us to deliver better ads to people while using less data. That's core to all of our safety and security work. Um, it has meaningfully improved the relevance of reels and overall content ranking in general. And it pays, plays a big role um, in our, co our commerce efforts. 
artificial intelligence is also going to play a big role in our work to help build the metaverse. We just announced our AI research supercluster, which we think will be the world's fastest supercomputer once it is complete later this year. And this is going to enable new AI models that can learn from trillions of examples and understand hundreds of languages, which will be key for the kinds of experiences that we're building. Now, looking ahead, uh, we're focused on further scaling our computing power and transforming our AI infrastructure through advances in foundational research, as well as improvements to data center design, networking, storage, and software. Now, the last investment priority here is the metaverse. We are focused on the foundational hardware and software that are required to build an immersive, embodied internet that enables better digital social experiences than anything that exists today. On the hardware front, uh, we're seeing real traction with Quest 2. People have spent more than $1 billion on Quest Store content, helping uh, virtual reality developers grow and sustain their businesses. Uh, we had a strong holiday season, and you know, Oculus reached the top of the App Store for the first time on Christmas Day in the US. We're working towards a release of a high-end virtual reality headset later this year, and we continue to make progress developing Project Nazare, which is our first fully augmented reality glasses. Now, as for software, uh, Horizon is core to our metaverse vision. Um, and this is our social uh, VR world building experience that we recently opened to people in the US and Canada. And we've seen a, a number of talented creators uh, build worlds, like a recording studio where producers collaborate or a relaxing space to meditate. And this year, we plan to launch a version of Horizon on mobile too. So that'll bring uh, early metaverse experiences to more surfaces beyond VR. So while the, the deepest and most immersive experiences are going to be in virtual reality, uh, you're also going to be able to access these worlds from your Facebook or Instagram apps as well, and, and probably more over time. So this will enable us to build even richer social experiences where you can connect with friends in the metaverse, uh, whether they're in VR or not. We're also focused on avatars, which will be how you represent yourself in Horizon and across other developers' experiences in the metaverse. In December, we rolled out our Metaverse Avatars SDK to all Unity developers on Quest and Rift and Windows-based VR platforms, letting developers bring meta avatars to their own VR experiences. We just announced an update that lets you further customize your avatar to better express yourself. And we're introducing digital clothing too, starting with an NFL partnership so you can cheer on your favorite team. You can use your avatar across Quest, Facebook, Instagram, and Messenger. Uh, and so it serves as another bridge between our 2D social apps and 3D immersive virtual reality experiences. And we have a bunch of work ahead to make the avatars as expressive and high fidelity uh, as they need to be to fully represent us and help us feel present with one another. But I am very excited for the advances that we're making here. Now, making meaningful progress across all seven of these areas is going to improve the services that we offer today and will help power a more social, intuitive, and entertaining metaverse where people, businesses, and creators can all thrive. And this fully realized vision is still a ways off. And although the direction is clear, our path ahead is, is not yet perfectly defined. But I am pleased with the momentum and the progress that we've made so far, and I am confident that these are the right areas and investments uh, for us to focus on going forward. 2022 is the first page of the next chapter for our company. Um, I'm grateful for all the talented teams at Meta and our partners for executing on this important work, and of course, for all of you who are on this journey with us. And now, here is Cheryl. Thanks, Mark, and hi, everyone. Our total ad revenue in Q4 was $32.6 billion, which is up 20% year over year. The close of the year also marked the first time our business generated more than $100 billion in annual revenue. I want to congratulate our teams and thank our partners for helping us reach this milestone. Throughout 2021, we saw solid growth, which continued in Q4. But there were a number of dynamic factors that created headwinds for us this past quarter, in addition to those Mark, Mark described 
around competition and our shift to short form video. We were lapping a period of strong demand in 2020 that benefited from very strong growth in online commerce, which has since slowed. Q4 was also the first holiday season after Apple's iOS changes, which have had an impact on businesses of all sizes, especially small businesses who rely on digital advertising to grow. This will continue to be a factor in 2022. We've also heard from advertisers about other macro trends that contributed to the headwinds in Q4, including global supply chain disruptions, labor shortages, and inflationary pressures. pressures. A number of industry reports have pointed to people shopping earlier in the holiday season to avoid potential supply chain issues and shipping delays. This is in line with the behavior we saw from advertisers, many of whom front-loaded their spend earlier than usual. Mark talked about seven areas of investment. I'd like to talk about our progress in three of those, ads, commerce, and messaging. First, ads. Like others in our industry, we faced headwinds as a result of Apple's iOS changes. As we described last quarter, Apple created two challenges for advertisers. One is that the accuracy of our ads targeting decreased, which increased the cost of driving outcomes. The other is that measuring those outcomes became more difficult. These challenges are complex and interrelated. We're working to try and improve things, for example, by making progress in closing the underreporting gap for iOS web conversions and by introducing tools like our aggregated events measurement solution to deliver better insights for advertisers. These efforts will help to mitigate some of the challenges, but we expect the overall targeting and measurement headwinds to moderately increase from Apple's changes and from regulatory changes in Q1 and throughout 2022. On the shift to short form video, I want to emphasize that while we're going through a transition, we're optimistic. Right now, Reels monetizes at a lower rate than speed and stories, but we expect this to improve over time. We've made successful transitions before, the shift from web to mobile, and then another shift from feed to stories. We have a playbook here. The experience we have for monetizing stories is directly applicable, so we're not starting from scratch. We think that over the long term, this shift will be a success for us and our partners too. Second, commerce. We launched a number of new tools in Q4. We released new features like ratings, reviews, and community replies to product questions, and significantly improved checkout stability. We brought shops to groups, and we started testing live shopping for creators, an early glimpse of the immersing shop, immersive shopping experiences that will be possible in the metaverse. Our commerce strategy remains focused on three areas continuing to be the best place for advertisers to find customers and get strong ROI, making it easier to sell on our platform and improving the customer experience. We still have a lot of work to do compared to other mobile and web shopping experiences, but we're seeing promising early signs. It's great to see businesses and consumers using social and immersive shopping experiences like product tags, drops, and live shopping. A good example is the Laundra a premium fabric care and home cleaning brand from Unilever that wanted to build awareness of a new line <clears throat> it developed with the musician John Mayer. In November, they launched exclusively on Instagram for 24 hours and hosted a live shopping event, a conversation between John Mayer and Laundress co-founder Lindsay Julia Boyd, where people could buy the new products as they talked about them live. The hour-long event generated more than $40,000 in sales. Overall, we're pleased with the engagement we saw with our commerce tools over the holiday season and view Q4 as a promising milestone in our multi-year journey. Third, business messaging. Our focus is on helping businesses and consumers connect. Our largest monetization effort is click-to-messaging ads, where you click on an ad in your Facebook or Instagram feed, and it opens a chat with the business messenger, Instagram direct, or WhatsApp. It's a great way for businesses to drive engagement. And we've seen lots of demand from consumers who want to use our messaging apps for everyday services like utilities, financial services, education, and travel. In Q4, we expanded the types of information people can choose to receive from businesses and the format in which they can interact. We're continuing to invest in new tools to make it easier for people to help and make purchases right from a chat. More than 150 million users globally now view a business catalog on WhatsApp each month. And new features like collections on WhatsApp help businesses organize their products and make it straightforward for people to find things to buy. As we enter 2022, our focus is where it has always been, 
building products that help people connect and businesses grow. We're making long-term investments to evolve our business and continue to drive real value for our partners. In the coming year, we'll continue to invest in things that improve ad performance for our clients in short form video like Reels and in making the commerce experience better for consumers and marketers on our platforms. As ever, I'm grateful to our partners around the world, big and small, who we learn from every day. And to our teams at Meta who work so hard to help businesses through the holiday season and beyond. Now here's Dave. Thanks, Cheryl, and good afternoon, everyone. As we announced in October, beginning this quarter, we were reporting revenue and operating income in two segments, Family of Apps and Reality Labs. I will begin by discussing our consolidated results before moving to segments and ending with our outlook. All comparisons are on a year-over-year -year basis unless otherwise noted. We delivered solid results in the fourth quarter, ending a strong year for our business as full year 2021 total revenue grew 37% to nearly $118 billion. Q4 total revenue was $33.7 billion, up 20% or 21% on a constant currency basis. Unlike the first three quarters of 2021, we experienced a currency headwind in Q4 and had foreign exchange rates remain constant with Q4 of last year, total revenue would have been about $307 million higher. Q4 total expenses were $21.1 billion, up 38% compared to last year. In terms of the specific line items, Cost of revenue increased 22%, driven primarily by Reality Labs hardware costs, core infrastructure investments, and payments to partners. R&D increased 35%, driven primarily by hiring to support family of apps and Reality Labs, as we increased, as well as increased Reality Labs R&D operating costs. Marketing and sales increased 34%, mainly driven by marketing spend and hiring. Lastly, G&A increased 107%, driven primarily by legal-related costs and employee-related costs. We added over 3,700 net new hires in Q4, the majority in technical functions. We ended the quarter with over 71,900 full-time employees, up 23% compared to last year. Fourth quarter operating income was $12.6 billion, representing a 37% operating margin. Our tax rate was 19%. Net income is $10.3 billion, or $3.67 per share. Capital expenditures, including principal payments on finance leases, were $5.5 billion, driven by investments in data centers, servers, network infrastructure, and office facilities. Free cash flow was $12.6 billion. We repurchased $19.2 billion of our Class A common stock in the fourth quarter, and we ended the quarter with $48 billion in cash and marketable securities. Moving now to our segment results. I'll begin with the Family of Apps segment. Q4 total Family of Apps revenue was $32.8 billion, up 20%. Q4 Family of Apps ad revenue was $32.6 billion, up 20% or 21% on a constant currency basis. On a user geography basis, year-over-year -year ad revenue growth was strongest in Asia Pacific at 31%. Rest of world, Europe, and North America grew 28%, 20%, and 15% respectively. Currency was a modest headwind in all international regions. In Q4, the total number of ad impressions served across our services increased 13%, and the average price per ad increased 6%. Impression growth was primarily driven by Asia Pacific and rest of the world, while impressions in North America declined 6% year over year. On a global basis, impression growth benefited from ad load increases in user growth. This was partially offset by engagement-related headwinds as we face increased competition for people's time and a shift of engagement within our app's video services like Reels, which show fewer ads than speed or stories today. Pricing growth was broad-based across regions. Worldwide pricing growth slowed from the third quarter as we lacked stronger growth in the year ago period and faced currency headwinds. Pricing was also negatively impacted by advertisers facing challenges from macroeconomic factors and measurement and targeting headwinds. Family of apps other revenue was $155 million, down 8% due to a decline in payment revenue earned from gains. Family of apps expenses were $16.9 billion, up 35% due to higher legal related costs, employee related expenses, marketing and infrastructure, marketing infrastructure related costs, and payments to partners. Family of apps operating income was $15.9 billion, representing a 48% operating margin. We estimate that approximately 2.8 billion people used at least one of our family of apps on a daily basis in December, and that approximately 3.6 billion people used at least one on a monthly basis. 
Facebook daily active users were 1.93 billion, up 5%, or 84 million compared to last year. DAUs represented approximately 66% of the 2.91 billion monthly active users in December. MAUs grew by 115 million, or 4% compared to last year. Facebook user growth was impacted by a few headwinds in the fourth quarter. In Asia Pacific and rest of the world, we believe COVID resurgences during prior periods pulled forward user growth. User growth in India was also limited by an increase in data, price, data package pricing. In addition to these factors, we believe competitive services are negatively impacting growth, particularly with younger audiences. Within our Reality Lab segment, Q4 revenue was $877 million, up 22%, driven by strong Quest 2 sales during the holiday season. Reality Lab's expenses were $4.2 billion, up 48%, driven by employee-related costs, R&D operating expenses, and cost of goods sold. Reality Lab's operating loss was $3.3 billion in the fourth quarter. For the full year 2021, Reality Lab's operating loss was $10.2 billion. Turning now to the outlook. We expect first quarter 2022 total revenue to be in the range of 27 to $29 billion, which represents 3% to 11% year-over-year growth. We expect our year-over-year growth in the first quarter to be impacted by headwinds to both impression and price growth. On the impression side, we expect continued headwinds from both increased competition for people's time and a shift of engagement within our apps towards video services like Reels, which monetize at lower rates than feeds and stories. On the pricing side, we expect growth to be negative and negatively impacted by a few factors. First, we will lap a period in which Apple's iOS changes were not in effect, and we anticipate modestly increasing ad targeting and measurement headwinds from platform and regulatory changes. Second, we will have a period of strong demand in the prior year, and we're hearing from advertisers that macroeconomic challenges like cost inflation and supply chain disruptions are impacting advertiser budgets. Finally, based on current exchange rates, we expect foreign currency to be a headwind to year-over-year growth. In addition, as noted on previous calls, we also continue to monitor developments regarding the viability of transatlantic data transfers and their potential impact on our European operations. Turning now to the expense outlook. We expect 2022 total expenses to be in the range of 90 to $95 billion, updated from our prior outlook of 91 to $97 billion. Our anticipated expense growth is driven by investments in technical and product talent and infrastructure-related costs. We expect 2022 capital expenditures, including principal payments on finance leases, to be in the range of 29 to $34 billion, unchanged from our prior estimate. Our planned capital expenditures are primarily driven by investments in data centers, servers, network infrastructure, and office facilities. As we discussed previously, this range reflects a significant increase in our AI and machine learning investments, which will support a number of areas across our family of apps. While our Reality Labs products and services may require more infrastructure capacity in the future, they do not require substantial capacity today, and as a result, are not a significant driver of 2022 capital expenditures. On to tax. Absent any changes to U.S. tax laws, we expect our full year 2022 tax rate to be similar to the full year 2021 rate. Separately today, we announced that our Class A common stock will begin trading on NASDAQ under the ticker symbol Meta in the first half of 2022. The new ticker symbol aligns with our rebranding from Facebook to Meta. In closing, 2021 was a strong year for our business and an important year for the company as we aligned our corporate identity with our long-term ambition to build the next generation of online social experiences. We're investing aggressively in 2022 to support our product roadmap as we work to deliver new and engaging experiences for people and support the businesses and creators who rely on our services. With that, France, let's open up the call for questions. We will now open the lines for a question and answer session. To ask a question, press 1, followed by the number 4 on your touchtone phone. Please pick up your handset before end your question to ensure clarity. If you are streaming today's call, please mute your computer speakers. And our first question is from the line of Brian Nowak with Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Thanks for taking my questions. I have two. The first one on the uh, the reels transition. You know, you y'all talked about how you've been through other transitions in the past with mobile and stories, et cetera, and you successfully navigated through. 
Is, is there anything that's that's unique or more challenging about the reels transition that makes you think it could take potentially longer to sort of scale those ad products for this format as opposed to other formats in the past? And then the second one, Dave, when you sort of talk about the the headwinds around ad targeting and measurement becoming larger in the first quarter and in 2022, is there anything other than sort of year-on-year -year data comps there, or are you expecting other other changes from a signal perspective and maybe help us understand any further changes you expect to come on the signal loss perspective? Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Brad. I could probably take both of those. Or... Yeah, so on, on the, the characteristic of Reels, it makes it, you know, quite similar to the transitions that we've gone through before. Um, as in the past, when we were focused on stories, you know, we're really focused on consumer experience and, and really making short form video work effectively on both Instagram and Facebook. And, and we're already seeing that be the, you know, the, the biggest driver of growth on Instagram and it's growing very quickly on Facebook. So we're really encouraged by what we're seeing, but we're really focused on making the consumer experience right. Um, and over time, we do think it's a format that will work effectively for advertising. And we think the experience that we have for stories will really lend itself well uh, in the Reels format. So, you know, we're confident in our ability to monetize over time, but right now there's, you know, relatively few ads in story, uh, sorry, relatively few ads in Reels today. So it's definitely something that from an impression growth and monetization uh, perspective is gonna, is gonna be a headwind. Um, on iOS 14, you know, we, we, we saw the revenue impact with uh, iOS 14, sorry, iOS just in general, uh, in Q4, and that was in line with our expectations and, and, and similar to the Q3 headwind. Um, but obviously, as we go into 2022, we're going to be lapping a period in which uh, in Q1 and Q2, uh, those uh, headwinds were not in place in, in, in the year ago period. So that definitely makes for a tough comp in the first half of the year. And you know, we believe the impact of iOS overall as a headwind on our business uh, in 2022 is on the order of $10 billion. So it's a pretty significant uh, headwind for our business. And, you know, we're seeing that impact, you know, in a number of verticals. Uh, E-commerce was an area where uh, we saw, a, you know, a meaningful slowdown in growth in Q4. Uh, and, and similarly, uh, we've seen other areas like gaming be challenged. But, you know, on e-commerce, you know, it, it's quite noticeable, notable that, you know, Google called out seeing strength in that very same vertical. Um, and so, you know, given that we know that e-commerce was one of the most impacted verticals from iOS restrictions, it makes sense that those restrictions are probably part of the explanation for the difference between what they were seeing and what we were seeing. Um, and if you, if you look at it, you know, we believe those restrictions from Apple are designed in a way that carves out browsers from the tracking prompt Apple requires for apps. Uh, and so, you know, what that means is that search, act, search ads, you know, could have access to far more third-party data for measurement and optimization purposes than app-based ad platforms like ours. Um, so, you know, when it comes to using data, you can think of it as, you know, there's, it's, it's, that it's not really apples to apples. Uh, for us. Um, and as a result, uh, you know, we believe Google's search ad business could have benefited relative to services like ours that face a different set of restrictions from Apple. Uh, and, you know, given that Apple continues to take billions of dollars a year from Google search ads, the incentive clearly exists for this policy discrepancy to continue. Our next question is from Eric Sheridan with Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Thanks so much. Uh, maybe two questions that I can. First, following up on, on Brian's questions about Reels, I think when we've gone through these transitions before, you've talked a little bit about what you're seeing from an engagement standpoint about Reels and how levels of engagement compared to other forms of engagement from a consumer perspective on the property and what the differential might be in terms of while it's early innings, in terms of differential of ad pricing and how you think to to close that gap. Is there any willingness you're able to give us on both engagement levels or pricing differential so we can think through what the transition scope might need to be? Um, and then Cheryl, on the last call, if I remember correctly, you talked about elements of as we move into Q1 in the first half, some of the workaround efforts that the team uh, were trying to implement would start to show some efficacy. Can you give us an update on where you stand internally on workarounds and broader advertiser community accepting of some of the workarounds on targeting and measurement as we move into the first half. Thank you. 
Sure, I, I can start with um, with your first question on some of what we're seeing on engaging on engagement. Um, reels and short form video overall are very engaging, and you know a lot of what we're seeing is that there is you know people are spending a lot a lot more time and um, you know, I think I mentioned this in my script up front that you know, it's growing very quickly. This is already the biggest contributor to engagement growth on Instagram. Um, and I think is one of the biggest contributors that we're seeing to, to positive engagement on Facebook too all, already. Um, but I think going back to the last question, when you when th there was a question about what, you know, are there any factors here that will, what, what are the similarities and differences to, to what we've seen in the past? The big similarity is that this is, you know, certainly not the first time that we've gone through a major format evolution. Um, and, you know, what these transitions have all had in common from desktop feed to mobile feed, feed to, to stories, and, and, now, um, and now to reels, is in the beginning, our ad system and business are not as tuned for the new format. Um, so as the engagement in the new thing starts to replace some of the engagement in the old thing, it creates a near-term um, headwind for, for revenue, but it, it, it's not that part, is, it, at this point now, is not that, that big of a concern for us. I mean, it, it makes some of the stuff um, you know, not, not as clean in the near term, but over the long term, we're pretty optimistic about that. The dynamic that I think is actually a little bit different with reels um, than what we've seen with stories and mobile feed in the past is with reels, uh, I, I would say that the, the teams are executing quite well and the product is growing very, very quickly. The, the thing that is somewhat unique here is that TikTok is so big as a competitor already and also continues to grow at quite a fast rate off of a um, off of a very large base, and um, so that that you know to the question that, that was asked before around are we um, are, are like that was asked before around is there anything that's going to make it so that we uh, it takes us longer to to kind of get to where we want on this? It is that you know even though we're compounding extremely quickly, um, that's you know, we also have a competitor that is that is compounding at a, at a pretty quick rate too. But overall, back to the question, Reels um, is extremely engaging. I think overall engagement will grow as a, as a part of this, um, and and um, and that's why we're optimistic about the future. But there's a lot of work to do here. And then Cheryl, were you going to take the yeah. second part of the question on the mitigation front? Yeah. So when we talked about mitigation, we've said there are two key challenges from the iOS changes: targeting and measuring performance. On targeting, it's very much a multi-year development journey to rebuild our ads optimization systems to drive performance while we're using less data. And as part of this effort, we're investing in automation to enable, enable advertisers to leverage machine learning to find the right audience with less effort and reduce reliance on targeting. That's going to be a longer term effort. On measurement, there were two key areas within measurement which were impacted as a result of Apple's iOS changes. And I talked about this on the call last quarter, as you referenced. The first is the under-reporting gap. And what's happening here is that advertisers worry they're not getting the ROI they're actually getting. On this part, we've made real progress on that under-reporting gap since last quarter. And we believe we'll continue more progress in the years ahead. I do want to caution that it's easier to address this with large campaigns and harder with small campaigns, which means that part will take longer and it also means that Apple's changes continue to hurt small businesses more. The second area underneath the measurement challenge is really are really data delays. As part of the iOS changes, we and many other app platforms, we receive less granular conversion data on a delayed basis. And what advertisers shared with us that this makes real-time decision-making especially difficult. And that's particularly important during the holiday period where people are often spending a lot and really monitoring their ads and adjusting spend, you know, not even on a daily basis, but often on an hourly basis. And that was one of the challenges we faced during this holiday quarter. Our next question is from Justin Post with Bank of America. Please go ahead. Great, thank you, a couple. Mark, just on a big picture basis, you're, you know, you're adding a lot of short form video and, and maybe the content shifting from content from your friends to, to general content. What, what does that mean for Facebook? I'm sure you've thought about a lot of it, but what, how do you think about the evolution of, of Facebook as a platform? 
And then, and then for Dave, um, as, as you think about the measurement and targeting challenges, when we get out to September and October, you know, should we be effectively lapping the, the, the issues or is there, is there reason to think it, it could actually get worse in, in the second half? Um, just thinking about revenue growth kind of reaccelerating. Thank you. I can take the first one. So for, for Facebook, I think, you know, content from your friends is always going to be an important part of the experience. And so we'll be discussing stuff that you find with friends, whether it's in a group or community or uh, public content or reels or, you know, news or different content like that. But I, I think overall you're right that the, the balance of content that people see in feed is shifting a little bit more towards, um, towards stuff that isn't coming from their friends, um, which you may discuss with your friends, but, but is, is kind of shifting towards more public content. I think at the same time we're seeing this trend where I mean, if you think about your your day to day behavior on on a lot of this stuff, it, it's you know this this pattern may may resonate with you. But um, you know a lot of people now are, are taking a lot of the content that they may have previously shared in a feed and sending it to friends over um, over chats. You know whether it's one on one or through group chats. And this is one of the reasons why I called out community messaging as one of the major priorities for us. Because if you look at the overall constellation of services, um, a lot of the kind of personal sharing is sort of shifting towards messaging. Um, and a lot of the, uh, what we're seeing in feeds is, um, is basically this content consumption um, and, and, a, and, a, and a lot of, of just really highly engaging um, content that, that forms the basis for conversations, whether it's in chat or in comment threads in those feed apps, but that that um, you know that type of creative work is a lot more of what we're seeing across the feed apps, whether that's Facebook or Instagram. Uh, hey, hey, Justin, it's Dave. On the um, on the second part of your question, it's it's really about sort of what's the landscape of headwinds look like as it relates to targeting and measurement. Um, and there, I think what we're seeing is kind of two things going on. We've got incremental headwinds coming from things like iOS 15. Uh, which provides some additional sort of uh, targeting and measurement headwinds, but those are those are far less significant uh, than than the changes made with iOS uh, 14.5, which really started to have an impact more seriously on the business in the second half of last year. So I think the lapping effects can be very pronounced in the first half of the year, where we're lapping uh, periods that you know didn't have that impact. Uh, so that's where we're going to see the biggest impact from. Uh, from the lapping, but we're continuing to face more headwinds as it relates to like iOS 15 and also, uh, you know, further regulatory headwinds uh, that restrict the use of data for targeting purposes in regions like Europe. So we're continuing to see headwinds. I think we're working to mitigate those. Um, but, you know, the biggest lapping effect will be in the first half of the year where we didn't have the big iOS 14 headwinds in the same period last year. Our next question is from Doug Anmuth with J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead. Thanks for taking the questions. Um, Mark, you talked last quarter, I think, about how Reels would become better integrated into both Facebook and Instagram. Can you just talk about where you are in that process? Um, clearly, we've seen some. Just curious if there's more in the product pipeline, and could that deeper integration uh, potentially have even greater drag on revenue going forward? And then, Dave, just curious, uh, if you're willing to comment on a Reality Lab uh, spend or, or loss number in 22. I can talk about the first piece. I mean, I think we're, we're probably a little further along than just the beginning, but I'd say we're closer to the beginning than the end of, of the trend on, on, on Reels. Um, you know, there's a, a big flywheel here where more creators share more content and um, because we have a mix of content in, in the feeds, um, you know, from all different types, um, we're only going to show reels or recommend them um, if, if we, we feel like there's high quality content to show. So as there's more high quality content, we show more of it. There, there certainly will be um, a lot more. We think it's growing. It, it, it is going to grow a lot um, going forward, we believe, in, um, in, in engagement on, on both of those platforms. So. Yeah, I mean, I think that we, we probably will see, uh, in, in, as we're forecasting, and I think Dave is talking about here, you know, the, the relative monetization rate of reels um, for the next 
I don't know, for whatever the foreseeable future is, um, will be lower than speed uh, as, as we kind of displace some of that with this. But, you know, over time, we think that there's a, a potential for a tremendous amount of overall engagement growth. And we think that um, in a steady state over time, um, we think that Reels should monetize closer to theater stories than other, you know, longer form video. So, um, so I think we're optimistic about it. And I think that that's, we think it's definitely the right thing to lean into this and to push as hard to, to grow Reels as quickly as possible and not hold on the brakes at all, um, even though it may create some, some near term, um, you know, silver growth than we would have wanted. That's, that's kind of, that's the picture that I see. I don't know if you want to add anything to that. No, I, I think that's, that's exactly right. And that's what's kind of factored into the guidance we're providing specifically for Q1. Um, and then, uh, Doug, on the expense outlook, we're not breaking out uh, expenses by, um, you know, by segment, but I, I probably can get some color here. You know, we're expecting accelerating headcount growth in 2022 to be the biggest uh, contributor of expense growth. And, that's largely in tech and product roles to support the seven product priorities that Mark laid out, Reels, community messaging, commerce, ads, privacy, AI, and the metaverse. And um, you know, the, uh, you know, a number of those investment priorities map to our family of apps uh, segment, and we expect family of apps to continue to drive the majority of expense growth in 2022, uh, though we do expect Reality Lab operating loss to increase meaningfully in 22. And that's incorporated into our outlook. Our next question is from the line of Mark Mahaney with Evercore ISI. Please go ahead. Mark. Mr. Mahaney, your line is open, sir. One more time. Okay, got it. Um, all right, I want to ask uh, two questions, please. First on ESG, um, could you just, uh, you, there's been a series of steps that have been taken, oh, reducing the ability to do political targeting, the introduction of the take break feature within Instagram, and maybe a few other things that, you know, arguably have been um, put out there to kind of address some of the ESG concerns. Where do you think you are in terms of addressing some of those that, you know, we've heard in the uh, investment community? And then, um, uh, Dave, I think you mentioned this $10 billion headwind, and I think that was related to some of these um, uh, these policy changes, Apple policy changes. Could you just give a little color as to how you came up with that number? Thanks a lot. Yeah, Mark, on the, on the headwind, we're just estimating what we think uh, is the overall impact of the cumulative IOS changes to uh, where 2022, our 2022 revenue forecast is. So if you kind of aggregate the changes that we're seeing across iOS, that, that, that's sort of the order of magnitude. We can't be precise on this. It's an estimate. Um, you know, we've got ranges on the impact to our business, but we think it's a, you know, it's a substantial, uh, you know, the substantial headwind to work our, our way through. And, and obviously we're working hard to, to mitigate those impacts and continue to make ads, you know, relevant and effective uh, for, uh, for users. I don't have anything specific on, on, on the ESG front, um, so uh, probably can't comment on that, can, can follow up with you offline on that. Our next question is from Yusuf Swali with Truist Securities. Please go ahead. Great, thank you. I have two questions as well. Um, Mark, you stated uh, your goal of refocusing on growth on um, of younger audiences on the last earnings call, and I think you even signaled back then that it could mean maybe less focus on other constituency. I I, I know you may be um, early, but any color maybe to share on growth on users and engagement by maybe age group um, age groups, and then. Um, Probably another question for you. I'm, I'm curious about when you think we can start seeing the kind of the meshing of apps like Instagram with AR and VR and the interoperability, uh, interoperability of these of these apps. Is that something where where you, you think we're going to see gradually evolve, or something that gets kind of open only once the metaverse is sufficiently built up, whatever that is? Thanks. Let me take the first one. I can take sure. the first one on, 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 on user growth. You know, I think, you know, what we said about, you know, overall kind of user growth is we're, you know, we're certainly seeing an impact from strong competition, particularly with younger audiences. So um, that's true. And we're kind of seeing that, um, seeing that globally. If you, if you look at kind of the overall 
uh, user growth landscape for uh, the fourth quarter. You know, we're seeing you know MAU and, and DAU in 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 the U.S. and Canada um, sort of you know bounce around as, as as sort of expected and indicated given our high level of penetration. And then you know if you look at uh, the rest of the rest of world, uh, you know, we've seen some some headwinds there, kind of that are a little bit unique in the quarter in, in areas like um, India where we saw data plan pricing increase uh, lead to you know slower growth there. So um, that's another kind of uh, some unique elements of the, of the quarter on that front. Sure, and, and in terms of uh, when are some aspects of the metaverse showing up? I mean. I talked about avatars in in my um, my remarks at the beginning, and and how you know, we're we're making it so you can have increasingly both expressive and eventually, and we've shown some demos around photorealistic avatars of yourself that you can show up in all the different apps, and your avatar can show up across Facebook and Instagram and, and Messenger as well as in Quest, and we'll expand that further. And I think I also commented before about uh, our goal uh, for 2022 to make it so that Horizon. Uh, works not just in, in immersive VR, but on 2D screens as well. So that way you could potentially jump into those kind of worlds from you know, Facebook or Instagram or, or, or different apps as well. So I think you're seeing some of that stuff um, will is, is already there. Some of it will come um, over the course of this year. Of course, the ability to message across apps is something that we've been working on for a while. You can already do that across Messenger and Instagram. And there's more there that... Um, that will roll out over time as well. So I think yeah, I think you are going to see this stuff work seamlessly across the family. Our next question is from John Blackledge with Cowan. Please go ahead. Uh, great, thanks. Uh, two questions, maybe first one for Mark. Uh, how is Reels differentiated versus TikTok, YouTube Shorts, and other uh, short form video services? And one for Cheryl, any further color on how um, SMBs are, are changing ad spend uh, budgets since the iOS changes, and is it slowing adoption of new SMB uh, advertisers on, on Facebook? Thank you. Sure. So I can start with Reels. Um, you know, one of the things that I think we've seen is that there are some fundamental formats in social media, like feeds and stories, and now I think this Reels um, short form video format that within the context of a different network or community the same format will take on different characteristics so you know, for example the kind of um, discussions that you might have in a feed on twitter or you know on pinterest are different from what you would do in facebook or um you know or, or, or instagram even given a relatively similar format um so i think to some degree you know even if, if a creator chooses to reshare um, their, their content across a number. You'll have different discussions with your friends um, across, uh, across the different services based on who's there. And then there's the social dynamic where, where friends and, and different communities create these as well. So you see somewhat different reels um, across Facebook and Instagram, and I'm, I'm sure you'd see different stuff across TikTok too. Um, but what we're seeing is that this is all growing incredibly quickly. So it's hard to know exactly where this is going to settle in the end. But um, but, I, but we just think the, the appetite that people have, um, you know, there's been this long-term trend that I've commented on a number of times where, you know, over the time that, that, that I've been running this company, um, it's 18 years this week, um, you know, basically we've gone from, um, you know, text being the primary way that people share and, um, and consume content online at the beginning of, of the early 2000s to, then we got, cameras on our phones and you know photos became the primary thing and now that you know mobile networks are, are starting to get have gotten really good um the video is really becoming the primary thing and it is a lot more natural and engaging um this is partially by the way why i think that an even more immersive format around virtual reality and and, and augmented reality is going to be the the kind of next step after video and why we're so invested there but but definitely what we're seeing with short-term video is it's the next step from the kind of visual feeds that we have um, and the amount of engagement and content that people want to share and interact with and whether it's taking it and sending it to a friend and messaging or commenting in line or just having fun watching it themselves it's um you know in, in general we're seeing that people want to spend a lot more time in this um than than what we've than what we've seen from from apps so far and that's also reflected in the success that other apps like tiktok have had so 
there's a lot more to go here. Um, we think we will have competitors across the industry, but you know, as we've seen with um, with some of these other formats too, it'll feel different depending on the context in which it's implemented and the content from from your friends. Our next question is from Lloyd I'm Walmsley so with sorry. UBS. Hey, I sorry, I, had, I think we had a follow up. Yeah, on the follow up I wanted to ask yeah. to the SMBs. So it's a good question because you know, as we've said, the iOS changes definitely hurt advertisers across the board, but they're much harder for SMBs. The progress we made on the measurement gap, which I talked about before, we've made more progress with larger clients than we have with SMBs. It's also the case that personalized ads are more important for SMBs. You know, an SMB really needs to buy a very small targeted audience that they're looking for. And the larger the business, the more you're able to, to personalize the ad less. So we're definitely seeing that this has more of an impact for SMBs. We do feel over the long run that we believe we have strong benefits for SMBs in using our ad system. We are going to continue to work on these measurement gaps and continue to make sure SMBs can use it. We're also working hard on SMBs adopting some of our commerce tools and some of our other solutions like business messaging and seeing, seeing some success there. But you are right that this remains a challenge. And our next question is from Lloyd Walmsley with UBS. You may go ahead. Uh, thanks for taking the question. Uh, maybe one for Mark and one for Cheryl. Uh, Mark, if we look at short form video, you know, how do you feel right now about the state of your content and your matching algorithm relative to where you want it to be? I mean, do you have the content you need? Are you getting it in front of the right users or is there, you know, is there a lot of room to improve this and drive more engagement? And then Cheryl, uh, where exactly are you in terms of rebuilding the ad product? And what are the key things uh, you need to see to, to kind of roll out? Or, or what do customers either need to adopt or do on their end to really start to see improvement to ROAS and, and a return of that budget? Like, is, are there certain features like CAPI that you need to get adopted? Are there tools in the pipeline? Are there things they need to do on their end? What, what do we need to see to, 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 to see that come back? I can take the reals question. So we do see a huge amount of potential ahead, but you know I think sometimes when when we say that um, that there's you know that we're, we're we're closer to the beginning, what that means is that we still have a lot of kind of fundamental questions to to overcome on, in order to make progress to get where we're going. With this product, what we see is there is very clear product market fit, and it is growing incredibly quickly. It uh, you know it's we, we face a, a competitor in TikTok that, that is a lot bigger, so it will take a while to compound um, and, and catch up there. But, but fundamentally, um, you know, we think that there's a, a, just a, a lot of potential for it to continue growing. So um, to your question of do we have the content that we need, you know, it's a flywheel. So, um, you know, the better tools that we can build for creators and the better monetization we can offer them, which tends to be an advantage that we have over over other competitors is how effective our, our monetization and ad systems are, then, you know, I mean, the, the, the bigger it gets, the more it'll attract more creators and, and it'll, it'll kind of build on itself. And we, we think that we're, we're already at a, at a scale where we're seeing that flywheel really kick in and start to grow. And if it keeps on compounding at the rates that it's growing at, then this is going to grow extremely quickly over the, over the next year um, and, and, and potentially beyond that. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's kind of the best summary that I can give of where we are. Um, clear product market fit, growing quickly, long way to go to catch up to be the, the biggest in the, in the, in the space. But, um, but I think the pieces are in place and, and the focus is certainly there um, at this point to, to, really, to really go after that. Um, it's just that as, as this grows, it is, it, it, at least for the you know, coming quarters, it's gonna monetize at a somewhat lower rate, which is reflected in the guidance that, that Dave gave. But you know, again, I think this is clearly the right strategy for us to push on. This is what people want. Um, they they enjoy the product. We're gonna so we're just gonna roll it out as as um, you know as quickly and as as, uh, as well as we can. On the question of what we need to see to rebuild ad products and continue to grow return on ad spend, in the short run, as I talked about, we're working on measurements. We're rolling out new ways to help businesses continue to measure campaigns uh, using Apple. SK ad network, API, and Meta's aggregated event measurement and conversion modeling. So we have specific products that people can adopt that help us. 
Over the longer term, we need to develop privacy-enhancing tech to help minimize the amount of personal information we learn and we use. Use more aggregate, use more anonymized data while still allowing us to show relevant ads. And that's gonna take us time. But one thing I do wanna point out is there are also a lot of things that small businesses and large businesses can do to take advantage of the many uh, targeting and measurement tools we have. So while we have seen an impact from these changes, we also didn't start from a place where 100% of our you know, millions and millions of advertisers are using the tools that are available. So while we continue to get those that were all the way on the adoption curve to you know, learn and adapt to these changes, there are also advertisers out there that aren't doing even the basic things yet that we can continue to work on and improve their performance. We still believe there's a lot of performance improvement left in the system. Great. Operator, we have time for one last question. Very good. Our last question will be from the line of Ross Sandler with Barclays. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks for squeezing me in. Um, I guess, Dave, a, a question on the family of apps segment margin. So this hasn't come up yet, but it was down about six points year on year. And I know that you had kind of forecasted the expense growth for 21, but I think that downtick is coming as a bit of a surprise for, for some folks who thought your ad business had fairly stable margins. So any more color on what's driving that? Is that just the revenue headwinds that you're experiencing or any other lumpy items? And then related to that, as you build out short form video, how does your thinking evolve around paying rev share like YouTube does or other things like that uh, to catalyze the shift? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, Rob. I, I think in terms of um, in terms of lumpy items, I mean, you will see that GNA was up, a, uh, you know, a pretty substantial amount in uh, in Q4. So a part of that is related to legal related expenses. Those tend to be um, tend to be lumpy. Um, so that there was a, a factor there. I, I think in general, as it relates to family of apps and and in margin, you know, I'd come back to the commentary that I made on um, you know on the investments that we're making and and family of apps, you know, being an area where we're investing heavily in in 2022 across the priorities that Mark outlined, including reels, you know, messaging, commerce, and ads. Um, there's a big investment that we're making on the capex side that's primarily geared towards you know AI and machine learning for. Um, you know, for the family of apps business, so, uh, so, you know, segment. So there's a lot of investment that we're making there. What was it? Let me make sure I get the second question. <laughs> oh, um, yeah, in, in terms of, you know, payments to partners, that, that clearly will, will play into the expense profile as we, as we, as we grow that, um, uh, as we grow short form. So, so that, that's also reflected uh, as part of the guidance for expenses, so um, you know, over time that, that will that will that will be an impact as well, and that's part of the investments that we're making, you know, on the real side, and is factored into the 2022 outlook. Thank you, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. We appreciate your time, and we look forward to speaking with you again. And this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for joining us. You may now disconnect your lines.